He's a, he's a newer friend to me in Action Church. And I just, I just wanna publicly honor you, uh, Pastor William. Uh, you hosted a, a conference here, I guess it was a couple years ago now. And I just, I snuck in a few different times and the presence of God that fell in those rooms and the, the mantle that's on your life and your family's life and deeper fellowship here in town. I think the church and the body of Christ is better because of the gift that you bring. And, uh, and you have changed my life from a distance. He's one of I think the most anointed worship leaders, phenomenal church, deeper fellowship. I could talk about all that he's done, but I just wanna thank you in front of our congregation for how you've invested in my personal relationship with God. I mean, the hours I've spent worshiping along with you, you didn't know, uh, but on Spotify or iTunes or Apple, you've led me in the presence of God and you have cultivated a, a heart of worship and, a, a, and an intimacy with God in my own life that I believe has spilled out over our church. And so I honor the man of God that you are, the husband, the father, the pastor, and I'm honored to link arms and, and pastor this city together. Could you stand to your feet at all of our locations and honor Pastor William McDowell. Awesome. Listen, can you stay standing for just a moment? I'm so honored to be with you. Um, I speak longer at my church than I have a chance to do here. And so because of that, I want to make sure I jump right into it. But there are two things I definitely want to do before you sit down. One is I would love to honor not only your church, I'm working my iPad while I'm doing it, uh, but also uh, honor your pastor and leadership uh, for what you are doing around this city. It's absolutely amazing, changing lives. And so can we together, I'm, I'm praising God for you as I clap, but can we also thank God for the wonderful leadership here at Action Church with a round of applause. Hallelujah. Now there's one more round of applause I'm gonna ask you to do, but this one's gonna be better than that one. Can we give Jesus praise as we clap our hands together? Awesome. Then right before you're seated, there's one last thing I want to invite you to do with me. I know that I'm a guest in your house. However, if you would oblige me this one thing, I grew up in a tradition uh, where when I was younger and when we would read the opening scripture, we would stand to honor the reading of the word of the Lord. And as I uh, got older and began to pastor, I didn't necessarily keep that tradition, but paying attention to society and how we've degraded and, and devalued and undervalued the word of God, we've begun to do that at deeper again to say that your word is above everything everything else. Uh, your word means more than anything else. There'll never be a, a piece of literature ever written or, or, or that will ever be written that will compare to the word of God. So we won't stand reading anybody else's book, but we will stand reading his word. Uh, and so we're going to stand together. I'm going to read Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, I'm going to start with verse 1. I'm going to read the first 11 verses of Ephesians chapter 3, uh, verse 1 through 11. Welcome to all the, the campuses watching around. Uh, Action Church around the city, also to our deeper uh, fellowship family watching. I, I brought a couple amens with me here. I'm so glad uh, as well. So if y'all don't say amen, I know I'll get a couple. Uh, and then also hello to our deeper global family watching from literally around the world, deeper fellowship in Namibia, deeper fellowship in Australia, uh, and then all the deeper global family in Africa and Europe uh, and, and around this nation and the Caribbean and all that stuff. We say we're, we're glad that you are watching. Literally um, thousands upon thousands of people are watching this together right now. Uh, this is the church. Amen. So let's read Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1 through 11, then I'll pray and let you get your seat. We'll jump right into it. When I think of all of this, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus for the benefit of you Gentiles, assuming by the way that you know God gave me the special responsibility of extending this grace to you Gentiles. As I briefly wrote earlier, God himself revealed his mysterious plan to me. As you read what I have written, you will understand my insight into this plan regarding Christ. God did not reveal it to previous generations, but now by his spirit has revealed to his holy apostles, revealed to his holy apostles and prophets. And this is God's plan. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe in the good news share equally 
and the riches inherited by God's children. Both are a part of the same body and both enjoy the promise of blessings because they belong to Jesus Christ. By God's grace and mighty power, I've been given the privilege of serving him by spreading this good news. Though I am the least deserving of all God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Father, I thank you. Lord, for all who are under the sound of my voice right now, who are either watching live or will ever watch a replay of this, I pray by the power of your spirit that you would illuminate your word to us, that it would cause us to change as a result of what we have heard, to change as a result of what you revealed. And I pray, as always, that I would make you proud and that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And because you are good, great, and glorious, I pray that you would reveal Jesus to those who are yet to, to meet him. And I pray that there would be salvation today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. I moved the chair. I don't know what that's going to do to your camera shot, but it, it'll be all right. <laughs> uh, I, I just want to say that this, this particular invitation has been initiated uh, months ago, but I've actually been excited from that day to this day, even though I did not know exactly what the Holy Spirit would want me to say. I know that this fellowship of what we're doing together, the fellowship of believers, is one of the most powerful things on earth. Um, this, this, what is happening right now uh, at Action Church uh, should happen more often, but it doesn't happen as often as it should, because even though we are one body, we don't always act like it. And so this is a major, major deal uh, that's happening. And, and I was just thinking about this significance in this moment. Uh, and I've been drawn to and led to a topic that has actually been on my heart for years. There's a number of different things that I carry kind of as life messages, but this has actually been something that's been on my heart for years. And so I recognize that because it's been on my heart for years, I've invested uh, probably at least a half a year of teaching uh, combined to our church alone on this subject. So I recognize that I cannot give it to you in 34 minutes. However, I can at least give you the, the introduction. The point of my introduction is this, to, to initiate or to invite us into a posture of prayer to say, what is my responsibility now that I've heard it? Every corporate word has an individual responsibility. Whenever we hear something corporately, it has an individual responsibility. Yes, it has a corporate responsibility, but it also has an individual responsibility, which is to say, Father, what am I to do with what I've heard? That's, that's the point. So I, I want to begin this as an initiation. Thank you, David, so much. I'm good right now. Um, Bishop Joseph Garlington, who is the pastor of Covenant Church of Pittsburgh, also my pastor and the president of Reconciliation Ministries International, has made this particular statement for years. In a divided society, only the church can model unity. In a divided society, only the church can model unity. I, I recognize that that may sound like a trite statement, but I'm going to unpack that for just a moment. Um, I, I think that while most of us would agree with that statement intuitively, most of us hear a statement like that and we look at it as an aspirational goal and not a commandment. I want you to recognize, uh, as you're listening to me in the different campuses and around the world, this is not just an aspirational goal of God. This is actually a commandment for the church. We are to do this. We are to, to model this wisdom. We are to model this. And I believe uh, wholeheartedly that we are in uh, a moment of distinction. I believe that this is the time uh, where, where God is literally uh, separating those who are true from those who are not. That that's the kind of season uh, that we were in, that we are in, and in order for the world to actually hear us, which is obviously uh, most church people, most believers uh, who evangelize at some level want people to be able to hear us. In order for the world to actually hear us, they must see first the authenticity of our life. Our message means nothing if it's disconnected from the way we live. Amen. So you can tell people all day about Jesus, but if your life doesn't reflect him, we have what I call a gospel crisis, which is that we are telling people about a Jesus that can change them but has not yet changed us. 
this level of disconnect or incongruence, the way that uh, actually uh, the, the Lord has set up all leadership, for example, is that the, the only gift required of leadership or pastoring is being apt to teach. Everything else is about how your life is. And the reason is because the life cannot be disconnected from the message. So I believe that one of the things that the Lord is doing in this season, uh, inviting our generation into, is congruence. To make sure that our life matches our words. Yes. So there, there are moments that, that, that happen in our lives and moments that happen uh, when we are alive or happen in a nation uh, that literally are moments of what I will define as a divine invitation, meaning an invitation from God, even if it's not something uh, that we feel like we're called to. We need to respond to it. We respond to invitations either by accepting them or rejecting them. We're never indifferent to them. So that, that's, that's where we are. And, and while I would love to talk about revival and talk about the move of God and talk about the presence of God and worship and evangelism and faith and the miraculous and principles of the kingdom, I, I feel compelled to actually talk about the moment of divine invitation that we are in. It does not take an astrophysicist or a rocket scientist to recognize that many of the problems that we are facing in our day right now predate our generation. That's just true. And so I have a friend who often says about certain issues, it's not your fault, but it is your problem. When, when, when certain issues arise in our life, a lot of times we want to push them off because they're not our fault. But the truth of the matter is, if it's on our plate, may, while it may not be our fault, it is our problem. It is our problem to deal with. Just, just speak this one thing with me. I won't make you talk. I know that's not necessarily a tradition, but speak this one thing. It may not be my fault, but it is my problem. I know some of y'all didn't want to say it because you're like, you know, it's not my fault or my problem. But I, I just, <laughs> I felt you, I felt you pushing back on me. But, but I just want you to know about all things spoken in, in your hearing, uh, you're responsible for them. So even if you don't like it, the Holy Spirit's going to remind you. All right. <laughs> some of y'all just turned me all the way off right there, but it's all good. We can't afford to take a hands-off approach to the problems of our day just because it's not our fault. Amen. What if God is trusting this generation with age-old problems because he knows that there are those among us who are willing to face these problems and willing to do the seemingly hard things and as a result see things change significantly? I, I was reminded of this passage of scripture in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 21. It's not on the screen. I'm just uh, summarizing it here. But, but what happened was uh, there was a drought in David's day. Uh, the drought lasted for three years. King David, uh, who we often talk about, uh, of quote psalms and things of that nature. King David was living through a drought, so he goes to the Lord and he asks the Lord, why is it uh, that this drought is happening? Uh, one translation says year after year after year, which is three years. And so three years, they're now going through a drought. Uh, don't understand why they're going through a drought. So he goes to the Lord and he asks the Lord, why is it that we are experiencing this drought? And the Lord speaks to him and he says, it's because Saul broke a covenant with the Gibeonites. Yeah. Who was king? David was king, but the drought was happening because Saul broke a covenant with the Gibeonites. But if you dig further into it, what you will discover is that the covenant that Saul broke wasn't a covenant that Saul made. It was a covenant that Joshua made. And so literally Joshua made a covenant that stood for years. Saul broke it, but it's David's problem. It's not your fault but it is your problem. And, and I believe that there are certain things that have arisen in our generation. There's certain things that have arisen in our day that may not be our fault, but they are our problem. And, and there are certain things that we necessarily don't want to deal with. And we wonder, well, why are, are people offended? And why is everybody offended? And why is everybody walking around on eggshells? And why is all this happening? May I present to you that it's possible because God has seen there's some people within this generation who actually deal with it? May I, may, I pose, may I pose that question? <clears throat> so it, it may not be my fault, but it is my problem. We received an invitation from God, and I don't want us to miss the moment. While it's not new, it is obvious that the nations are largely unsettled. If you... If you uh, I understand we have different uh, media silos and stuff, stuff like that, but if you kind of wade through all the noise, you'll at least see that it's unsettling in the nations. That, that, that large agreement here. Um, where, and those with spiritual eyes and ears can clearly recognize that as you see these things, there is in the earth a cry for help from the unbelieving world. 
Now, I recognize that we're in the world as well, and so we can recognize that. But for those who don't actually have the hope that we do, uh, the, the, the manifestations of what is happening is actually a cry for help from the unbelieving world. We need to, to learn how to recognize these things and appropriate them properly. Therefore, we wouldn't demonize when people are crying. Because it's very difficult to win those you demonize. <laughs> okay, all right. I, 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 y'all, y'all sitting on pins and needles like, okay, is this about to be a political? No, it's nothing political. I need us to understand that there are certain things that the Spirit of God wants us to understand. It, 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 it's important that we see those who are lost not as an enemy, but as a harvest. All right. So, so it's important for us. The world around us is essentially saying we are trying everything we can to possibly fix the brokenness around us. But most of us would say that even uh, last year, after a summer of upheaval and a summer of everybody in the streets and everything else, what's different? Except for the fact that people are angrier with each other. Because the world does not know how to fix it. Why? Because that is an assignment that has specifically been given to the Lord's church. So good. So good. Amen. Now, now, we have an answer, and his name is Jesus. Jesus. Now, most of us would clap and, and say, yeah, that's great, or whatever. But I, I want to take it a step further. Jesus has set this up and designed this so that he is specifically revealed through his bride, the church. Now, yes, he does reveal himself in supernatural ways around the world, uh, but his primary vehicle of revelation is his people. We, we have the collective responsibility, all of us, not just those who hold a microphone, but all of us have the collective responsibility of evangelism. And the collective responsibility of evangelism, I want you to know that evangelism has at least two components. I'll give them to you right now. One of them we are aware of. This is the one that makes most of us afraid, and that's proclamation. Evangelism has a component of proclamation, which is actually speaking or telling someone the good news. So when, when Pastor Justin just stood up here and, and said, you have an invite card, uh, that was a part of your assignment to say, listen, there are people in your sphere in your family, at your work, that need the hope of the gospel that you have. And therefore, it's important for you to take the step of evangelism. And, and here, here's, here's the amazing thing. Uh, churches have gotten so good at this that literally they're like, listen, you don't even need to say anything. Just pass out what we told them. <laughs> just, just say, hey, would, would you just consider, like, you like this song? There might be something that God wants to say to you about it. And you run off into your corner and get refreshed. <laughs> So proclamation is a part of evangelism, but there is another part of evangelism, and that is demonstration. Now, demonstration has uh, components to it as well. Demonstration itself is expressed in power by the operation of the gifts of the Spirit, which are the signs that accompany the proclamation. So, so um, God, if he, if he heals someone, that is a, a demonstration of the proclamation. There, there, is that, there is that component. When, when he delivers someone, meaning that you once were this, but now you are this, uh, that is a demonstration that the proclamation is true. This is one of the reasons why it's important that you keep your testimony. We all have the same testimony, different stories. Okay? So, so it's important. But there is another way of demonstration, and this part of demonstration is what the enemy is messing with in the earth. The other part of demonstration is the way believers love each other or treat each other. That is actually a part of demonstration. Okay. Demonstration is expressed by, or, or demonstration is expressed not only by the operation of the gifts, but it's also expressed in how we treat one another. Our love for one another is evangelism because it proves that the power of the Holy Spirit is at work. In other words, there's something bigger than me, greater than me, that causes me to respond and act in a way that others do not have in them. So good. Way, the way we treat one another screams loudly to the unbelieving world that there is something else, a greater power than that which is in the world, which gives us the ability to do something that those without God do not have the capacity or the ability to do. And what is that? It is love one another. But because in our English language, love has a bunch of different meanings and connotations, let me define the thing that believers have the ability to do that no one else has the ability.
ability to do. We're going to learn a couple of Greek words today. You've probably heard this one before. It is the word for love, which means agape. Believers have the ability to agape, which is to say to love genuinely, selflessly, and sacrificially as God does. That's what those who do not have Christ don't have the capacity to do yet. We have a different capacity to be able to reveal something different that screams loudly to the, to the unbelieving world. There's something more powerful than what you can see with your natural eye. The primary way the world, and when I say the world, I'm not just talking about that which is secular, nor am I talking about that which is cosmos. What I'm actually talking about, the primary way that the world, the way that the scripture defines the world in this context, uh, is actually a biblical word, which means those who are hostile and indifferent towards God. So it's actually talking about people who are hostile and indifferent towards God. So I'm not just talking about when you go to work or when you listen to certain kind of music or the cosmos. I'm actually talking about the unbelieving world. The primary way that the unbelieving world uh, will know that God sent Christ is the way that we love one another. Which reveals submission to the one who is greater than the world. The scripture lets us know this is how disciples will be identified. They'll know that you are my disciples by the way that you love one another. And in John 17, uh, our unity also becomes the additional proof to the unbelieving world that God sent Christ. So we have been given an assignment. Only the church can accomplish it. Even though those outside of the Christian faith mention this word often, it is impossible without the Lord. Are you ready? It is the word. It's a buzzword right now. Everyone talks about it. Everyone wants it. Wants it. We want it in our political spheres. We want it in our, in our social spheres and all that kind of stuff. It is the word unity. I want you to know today that unity is impossible without God. No matter who screams about it, no matter who goes on television about it, no matter what we tweet about, no matter what we Instagram about, it is impossible without Christ. I'm sure also that you might agree with that intuitively, but we have a phrase around our church when it's time to do something, open up our understanding, we say, let's go deeper. So, so can, I, can, can I get y'all, can I get y'all just, just to make me feel like I'm at home for a second, just say, let's go deeper. Now, we tend to idolize passages of Scripture like Acts 2.42. We, we idolize them. Maybe you don't idolize them, but if you've ever been to a, a church planning conference or a pastor's conference or something like that, um, we hold Acts 2 up like, okay, we need to get to this and, and that kind of thing. Maybe that's not what you think, but I'm, I'm going to show you how we idolize it in just a moment. Um, we idolize this Scripture as if it's a hypothesis or a description instead of a prescriptive reality of how the church is supposed to function. We look at our modern context and we explain it away as if it's different times for a different life thousands of years ago. But may I pose a question to you, Action Church? May I pose a question to you deeper around the world? What if that's exactly how it's supposed to be among believers? All right, let's read it. Let's read it. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over all of them, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God enjoying the goodwill of all the people. Each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who are being saved. Wow. Now, we, we read that scripture and we say, wow, the first century church was amazing as if that was for them only. <laughs> so when it says all the believers, who are they talking about? Verse 41 lets us know that 3,000 people were added to the church after Peter gave his first message after the pouring out of the, uh, outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So we're not just talking about a small little group of people. We're not talking about 20 or 30 or 50 people who were doing this. We're actually talking about thousands. And so that blows away the idea that it was the context of the small. Wow. That literally this is what the thousands of them were doing and God was adding to them. So it was growing while doing this. 
So, so this is the first church community. They were devoted to four things, to the apostles' teaching about Jesus, to fellowship, to breaking bread, and to prayer. And I just want to spend the balance of my time talking about just one aspect of those four things, and that's fellowship. They were devoted to fellowship. What does devoted mean? It's a steadfast and single-minded fidelity to a certain course of action. You won't remember that, so let me give you what devoted means. This is what mattered to them. Devoted, what matters to them, right? That, that's what devoted. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking bread, and to prayer. They were devoted. This is what mattered to them. Talking about Jesus, fellowship, breaking bread, sharing meals, including the Lord's table, and prayer. So, they were devoted to fellowship. Now, I gave you one Greek word, agape. Let me give you one more Greek word. It's the last Greek word I'm going to give you for today because it is. All right. Uh, <laughs> it is the Greek word for the word fellowship. Because the way in our context, again, in the English language, we don't always necessarily uh, have the nuances uh, of the original language or the way that it was written. Obviously, uh, scripture, a lot of it in Aramaic, but then translated into Greek, but still has a lot of different meanings. And so because of that, um, when we say the word fellowship, we think hanging out with one another. That's what we tend to think when we hear the word fellowship. But I want to give us a, a little bit deeper definition. Um, the Greek word, some of you may have heard it, some of you may have never heard this, and you're thinking, okay, this guy got up here wearing an African suit, talking in Greek, I don't understand. <laughs> like, what in the world are you doing uh, all nations thing going on here? All right. <laughs> fellowship, the Greek word is the word koinonia. It's the word koinonia. If you want to sound smart this morning, just say it with me. Say koinonia. koinonia. Now you can say, I, I spoke Greek in church today. This word, I need you to hear it, is specific to the church. Uh, it's unique to the church in that this, even though we see the word fellowship throughout Scripture, the actual word koinonia was not actually spoken by Jesus. Now you would think, okay, now why are you talking about a word that wasn't actually spoken by Jesus? I'm going to tell you why. Because it was the establishment of the church that triggered the establishment of the word. The word was not necessary before the establishment of the church because no one had the ability to do it. <laughs> Why? Because until Acts 2, there could not be koinonia on earth. I've said this over and over to our church, that koinonia is not a concept, but a revelation. What is a revelation? Something given by God to man. That's what a revelation is. Um, 50 days after Easter each year, parts of the church choose to commemorate Pentecost or the outpouring of the Holy Spirit or, or the, the Holy Spirit uh, filling or indwelling mankind. And in certain Pentecostal and charismatic, charismatic traditions, um, people usually use that time to celebrate what they define as a gift of the Spirit or what they define as a gift of speaking in tongues. If I may, may I introduce another way to look at Pentecost and specifically Acts 2, it's not singularly the celebration of man being able to speak in other tongues or unknown tongues. Some of you are probably like, I know, have no idea what that is. That's for those weird and crazy people down the street. I, I, I understand. Let me elevate your thought for just one second here. Um, it is not just that, but rather the celebration of the ability to walk out the revelation of divine mysteries. People could not walk out the revelation of divine mysteries until the Holy Spirit gave them the ability to. That's right. And so two ways you can look at it is that one, the Holy Spirit invited us into the ability to walk out what Paul defines as the mystery of unity. Two, it was the revelation of Christ in us, the hope of glory. This is the mystery that God kept before the foundation of the world. So koinonia or fellowship that produces unity was never expected of man until the third person of the Trinity filled man so that man could enter into the perfect koinonia that already existed in God. That's right. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit exist in perfect koinonia already. So I want you to understand. So now I read to you uh, Acts chapter 2, 42. Let's go back to Acts chapter 2, verse 1 really quickly. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. Until that happened, we could not do it. 
So what is this fellowship that we're talking about? What is, why did I use this Greek word koinonia and have your eyes glazed over wondering how I'm going to get from here to there? Let me help you. Because fellowship, while it means partnership, while it means sharing, while it means communion, uh, the word fellowship means all of those things. So when you take communion, you're doing koinonia. When, when you are hanging out with other believers, you are doing koinonia. But it has a deeper meaning than that. It has a greater meaning than that. The deeper meaning of the word koinonia is this, common ownership. The deeper meaning of the word koinonia or fellowship is the word or is the meaning common ownership. Common ownership of what? The Holy Spirit. Which is to say that what I have in me is the same as what you have in you. The fact that believers want to act like they are different is actually crazy when you consider the fact that we were saved by the same grace and filled by the same spirit. Fellowship, fellowship itself is common ownership. We have the same thing. And I want you to know this. It's not a voluntary association. It's not something you get to choose if I am going to be cool or love Pastor Justin or not. That's not my choice. We have the same Holy Spirit. We have the common ownership of the same thing. We may have different assignments, but we have the same calling. Yes, sir. So the word koinonia did not show up until the church was birthed because they didn't have common ownership of anything. Everything they had was theirs until he came. And so the word needed a people. The word would not have mattered until there were a people who actually had a common ownership. So, so, so what happens is this word is used most often by Paul, and this is important. Who is Paul? Paul is the one who was let in on the mystery of unity by the means of revelation, which is something given by God to man. He lets us in on this in Ephesians chapter 1, 2, and 3. And the fact that he uses it the most is not insignificant. To Paul, koinonia was the primary external manifestation of an internal revelation. In other words, what he was saying is, if you understand what you have, then koinonia is what flows out of you. It was the external manifestation of an internal revelation. If you understand that we all have Christ, it has, it has manifestations. So he used it the most. Luke uses the word to describe the believers in Acts. John uses the word in his epistles, and all of them are writing letters to the church. And they're saying... This is important, guys. This is important that we walk this out. Um, God left it as a mystery until the church was birthed. Amen. As one commentator put, put it, Satan knows the Bible <clears throat> better than some of us. He understood from the Old Testament scriptures that the Savior would come. He surmised that he would come, how he would come, and where he would come. He also understood why he would come for the purpose of redemption. But nowhere in the Old Testament would Satan find any prophecies concerning the church, which was a mystery of the Jews and the Gentiles united into one body, the called out ones. By concealing the mystery of unity throughout time, God was also concealing the church. He had to do it because the enemy was after the children of Israel because he thought, if I can take them out, I can stop God's plan. He had no idea that God had the plan to offer salvation to those who are not just the Jews. So God concealed the mystery of how how unity was even possible. How is it possible? Christ in you, the hope of glory, the Holy Spirit in you and me, giving us common ownership of the same thing. And the mystery just wasn't that everyone would sit at the same table. That was known. It was inconceivable to all that there would be one new people at the table. So people could see through hierarchical lens that we could sit at the same table as long as I sit in one place and you sit down there. 
What they could not see was that everyone sitting at the same table was one people. They couldn't see it. That was the mystery of unity. And so what happens is this mystery is hidden in plain sight. Jesus talks about it in Matthew chapter 8. I don't have time, but he proclaimed exactly what was going to happen in the ears of the people. But this is how you know it was a mystery. They heard it but couldn't conceive it. This is why the scripture says that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined the things that God has prepared for those who love him. But it goes on to say, but we know because God has given us a spirit. In other words, those mysteries are now available to us. They understood that it would mean they would sit at the same table, but not that there would be one people at that table. That was an impossibility based on the nature of man who by default... Because of the original sin, what did the original sin do? The original sin separated man from God and from each other. That is the part that we typically tend to miss. That's why when we talk about salvation, unfortunately, we use terms that we should not necessarily use, like Jesus is my personal Savior. Well, he he is in the fact that he saved you, but the cross is communal. It's not individual only. It is that he saved all of us. And so it's not just my salvation, it's our salvation. And so man, not only separated from God with the original sin, but also separated from one another because the Bible says that when they sinned, they, they, they sewed fig leaves together to hide their own nakedness. Why? Because they recognize that you're a sinner, I'm a sinner, we can't be with each other or God. And so this is literally what happened, and this is the reality that the world is still walking out, separated. And so we we like to say things like, why are you always trying to divide us? I want you to know that that is the default position of non-believers. Division is the default position of non-believers. That's why no matter what they say, no matter what they do, no matter what legislation they sign, no matter how many marches there are, no matter how many street signs you change, it will not produce unity. Only, only God. So Paul is sent as an apostle to the Gentiles He's a Jew given the assignment of being sent as an apostle to the Gentiles to proclaim to them what he calls God's mysterious will. He's to say that you've been outsiders the entire time, but God's about to make you family. He, he's been given this responsibility to proclaim it both to Jews and Gentiles. I want you to know that Paul uh, almost lost his life on multiple occasions trying to tell the unsaved that you can be saved. <laughs> So, so the scriptures tell us, um, I can read these in rapid form here, um, that, that God has now revealed to us this mysterious will concerning Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. And this is the plan, that at the right time, he'll bring everything together under Christ's authority. I'm reading Ephesians chapter 1, if you weren't following. Um, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9. Under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God, for he chose us in advance, and he makes everything work according to his plan. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of the law with his commandments and his regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross and our hostility towards each other was put to death. Jesus produced on the cross unity. Unity is what already is. Anything, we, we are not creating unity. Unity is what already is. What the enemy is trying to do is to obscure our vision so he can undo the cross but he cannot do it. He, he, here's the thing. He can't go back in time and undo it. So this is because the enemy doesn't have the power to do this. According to Galatians 5, what he wants to do instead is to get us to bite and devour each other. That's because if he can do that, he can cause the unbelieving world to believe that Christ hasn't come. I, I shared this 
this message with our church, and I said something um, that I, I had a personal problem with God inviting me to talk about this in this season because I recognize how polarized we are in every way. And I was like, God, if you're inviting me to say this right now, have you paid attention to what's going on in the world? This is like the worst time ever to be trying to say anything like this because everyone has an opinion about everything and they don't want to hear it right now. And I said to him, this is impossible. He said, good, now you're ready. It's impossible. I have just a couple minutes left, but I, I need you to know this. He raises the bar of this impossibility to let us know that we can't do it on our own. Koinonia is not hard. It's impossible. It's impossible. <laughs> now you're like, okay, you said all of that to tell us that we're supposed to be living this way, and now you're going to tell us it's impossible? Okay, great. I have no responsibility. No, it's impossible for you to do. It's impossible for us to do. It's impossible for us to do. Koinonia existed before the foundation of the world. It exists and is based in the spirit. It's expressed in actions, but it's not accomplished by actions. It can't be done. You don't do koinonia. Deeds don't equal koinonia. It cannot be accomplished by works, even though it finds its expression in deeds. Koinonia is actually the act of surrendering yourself to God and allowing him to do it through you. The result of our surrender is the act of fellowship. Um, I, I don't have the ability to love you like I should or treat you like I should. The depth of my surrender to God is revealed by the way I love you. If I can't love you, it is showing that I'm not surrendered. If I can't treat you this way, it is showing that I'm not surrendered to Christ. It is showing that I have another responsibility. It's, it, I, I need to go deeper. I need to surrender myself more. If stuff comes up in my heart that, I, that I, I know is not of God, it is revealing the areas of my life and my heart that need to be surrendered. It is saying that I'm not yet like you. Which is to say that, that we are to be like Christ. I have 40 something seconds left, which means I'm not going to finish everything, but I will say this. Here, here's the reason why I read to you Ephesians chapter 3. The reason why I read to you Ephesians chapter 3 was for this reason. God's intent in doing everything was to use the church to display his manifold wisdom, which is to say that he gave the church the assignment of displaying this. And guess what else he does? It says, display his manifold wisdom to unseen rulers and authorities in heavenly places, which means that when you and I love one another, he makes the devil watch. It is to say, I want to remind you of your defeat at the cross. Our responsibility, our responsibility is to surrender to God in such a way that every single day it reminds the devil that he lost. The way that I treat you reminds the devil of the cross that your time is short on the earth, that there's coming a day when your defeat will be so revealed to the world that Jesus will literally lead a triumphal procession with the devil and all his demons in chains. And the way that we display that now on the earth is the way we treat one another. Can I pray for you? Can I pray for you? Father, I pray that you would take these moments right here that we spin around your word and that you would do something significant in the hearts of your people. Lord, that we find ourselves at a place of surrender with you. Lord, that literally we would surrender in such a way that it would change the way that we live. I pray, Father, you, by the Holy Spirit, would do this work in the hearts of believers across this room and all the different campuses at action in a deeper global around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. I have one, one great privilege I have to offer those of you who have yet to come into saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I want you to know that, that trying to be good and, and get there on your own is actually impossible. There was a, a, a man, a rich young ruler, who came to Jesus and literally said, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus told him, well, keep the law, or keep the commandments. And the young man said, I've done all that, which is to say that I'm morally good. And Jesus said, there's one thing you haven't done. Go sell your possessions, give them to the four, come and follow me. And it's not a passage about money it was to say that there's one thing that has your heart more than me you're not willing to do that and so the Bible says that the young man walked away sad because he had many possessions or can I rephrase it for you many possessions had him the truth of the matter is he walks away and then Peter speaks up and he's like well Lord we've, if he can't be saved who can be saved and Jesus says to him with men it is impossible meaning 
and trying to achieve salvation through works and moral being morally good. It's impossible. With God, all things are possible, which is to say that if you will surrender yourself to him, he'll do the work. Some of you may be sitting in this room or watching in the campuses around this city or around the world and, and saying, um, I don't know what to do, but I have the answer for you. You surrender. You keep trying to, to do it yourself. You're always going to fall short. But if you would be willing to surrender your life to Jesus, he will do the rest for you. So um, I want to say to our deeper global family who's watching right now, um, I want to give you the opportunity to respond the way that we do. And so at this moment, Pastor Jason will take it from here uh, and give you the opportunity to respond in a way that allows us to connect with you. If you're here in this room, Thank you, Pastor William. Deeper, aren't you just so grateful um, for our pastor and the way he communicates the word? We, we hear it every Sunday, but I'm so delighted um, and just grateful for the way he, he, he represents us. I know you were fed and nourished um, by that, and we trust that Action Church there was also strengthened by the word. And I know, again, it, it was for them and for us, but because, you know, we, we hear them every uh, Sunday, um, Sunday, Sunday after Sunday, there's a part of us that just hear, hears him and watches that and go, yeah, uh, we're proud. We're so proud. And so while I know um, so much of what he's, he shared and so much of his heart and so much of what the Spirit communicated obviously uh, applies to us and we're taking it in and we'll continue continue to eat off of it. I know there's this, just that part of you that hears it and goes, knowing the context he in, knowing the context that he's in, you're just proud of the way uh, he delivers the word of truth. And so we thank you, Pastor William, uh, for uh, delivering the word of God in such a rich fa fashion there at Action and also how we were able to feast um, f from it. And so we just praise and honor the Lord um, for that revelation. Um, you might be um, watching and hearing Pastor William, you know, talk about unity um, and what a glorious subject matter um, that's so um, interwoven throughout all of the scriptures. Um, from Genesis to Revelation, you see God wanting to be among the people of God. But make no mistake that what he was saying ultimately applies to the family of God. You may say, what do you mean? You know, I, I have 10 kids, many of you know, and maybe some of you watching, you don't know. We have 10 children. And so sometimes I say things that are just for my family, but I say it loud enough so that other kids can hear. And so while he was talking to the family of God, there may be some of you that are not quite yet family. And while we, we are unpacking these things and hearing these things, it, it it only applies to some of us, but it doesn't yet apply to you because you have, you've not become a part of the family of God. But know that it's no accident that you're watching, that you've logged on, um, that you are, are streaming this morning. Perhaps you are being invited into the family of God. And before you get to Ephesians chapter three and the richness and the riches that Paul extols for us that are a part of God's family and the responsibility we have. There's another reality for you found in Ephesians chapter two that was also our reality. And that's the fact that we were born, as Paul says, in our trespasses and sin, that before we became a part of God's family, trying to do it God's way, we just wanted to do it our own way. And this is the bondage, this is the state that every believer found themselves in, not a part of the family of God, outside of the family of God, and not living for God, but living for themselves. But the, the Bible goes on to say in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sin, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter two that we were once dead, but we've been made alive. 
Why? Because of the rich mercy of God. Not the, not the small mercy of God or the, the little mercy of God, the abundant mercy of God. God's mercy overflowed to us who are in the family of God, but God's mercy is available to you who might not yet be a part of God's family. And I wanna to say to you that today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of your invitation, your invitation into the family of God. You can come home. You can come home and the truths that have been expounded upon, the truths that have been extolled, what you heard can become your reality. You can want to live this way by giving your heart to Jesus. See, we were dead without the ability to respond. A dead person can't respond. A dead person cannot carry out a command. God has to make you alive. And today, if you are feeling that burden, that conviction, that perhaps I'm not living the way that I should, I'm far apart from God, I'm telling you that's the provocation of the Spirit inviting you into God's family. He is wanting you to be made right. He is wanting you to accept what Jesus has done. Jesus, the Bible says, he who knew no sin in 2 Corinthians 5 became sin that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? That means Jesus took our place. He took our punishment. He took our shame. He took our sin. He took our guilt. He took all of those things upon himself to make us right before God. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That we were born, according to Ephesians, in sin. You don't, sin, sin doesn't make you, you don't, you don't sin because you are a sinner. You were born a sinner. In other words, it's not what you do, it's who you are. It's become your identity and your identity can change. You were born into sin, I was born into sin, but you can be made alive today by the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. You can be made right. And again, the truths that you heard extol those things that we've talked about, unity and what that means and living apart, being a part of the family of God and carrying out family values, all those things that the Apostle Paul goes on in Ephesians chapter three, that can be your reality today. You can be brought near and be brought into the family of God. You don't have to log off and live the same. You don't have to shut the stream down and go back to your old life. You can have a new life today if you'll trust in what Jesus has done. The Bible says, if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. He can literally give you a new start. And that sense of failure, that sense of slipping and falling and not living a life that pleases God can be washed away as the love of God overshadows you as you accept what Jesus has done. And so the question is, what will you do with that invitation? What will you do with that feeling that you might feel in the pit of your stomach, in the palm of your hands, something saying to you, you know what? I need to be saved. I need to give my life to Christ. And I want you to take advantage of the opportunity, the invitation that's being extended to you by the Spirit and become a part of God's family. You can be a part of God's family today. You can come into the kingdom. You can leave your old life behind and give your life to Jesus. He gave his life for you. He shed his blood for you. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. Sin has a penalty and it must be paid. And Jesus paid that penalty for you and I. But the question is, do you accept it? You can accept that or you could reject it, but you can't be indifferent towards it. But if you accept it, if you accept that today, if you accept what Jesus has done today, you can be made new. Because any man who's in Christ Jesus is a new creature. You can be made new. You cannot see the kingdom. You can't be a part of God's family unless you be born again. And you are born again by putting your trust in what Jesus did. You don't have to work for it. You can accept the work that he did. He went to the cross for you. He went to the grave for you. He satisfied sin's penalty for you and I. And your entire life can be different if you'll accept what Jesus has done. And so today, if you hear his voice, you hear his voice through my voice, you hear his voice through the voice of Pastor William, don't harden your heart. Accept the invitation. Say, I'm going to trust in Jesus and I'm going to accept 
what he's done for me. And so if that's you today, if you're watching this stream and you say, you know what, I want to give my life to Jesus, I want you to pray a prayer with me. It's not the prayer that saves you, it's your faith. It's your belief, it's your trust in what Jesus has done. And if you'll believe, if you'll trust in Jesus, you can be saved. And so if that's you, I want you to pray a prayer. And that prayer begins your new life. That prayer welcomes you into the family of God. That prayer leaves your old life behind. Not again, not because of the prayer itself, but because you now have belief in our entrusting what Jesus has done for you. And so pray this prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I confess I am a sinner and I need a savior. I ask you to come into my life. Make me new. Make me clean. I confess that I've missed the mark. I confess that I need you and I accept what Jesus has done for me, that he went to the cross for me, that he died for me and that he was raised to new life for me. And I put my trust in what Jesus has done. And for the rest of my life, I'll live for you all of my days in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I want you to put in the chat hashtag I met Jesus. That is a sign. That is you making a declaration that I am no longer in darkness. I am now in light. I am trusting in what Jesus has done. And our moderators there in the chat will welcome you into the family of God, connect with you, and begin to help you on this road. This is the day that the Lord has made. He made this day for you. And you should rejoice and be glad because you are now a part of his eternal family. And all the things that we've been preaching, all the things that you heard uh, moments ago are now part of your reality. And we thank the Lord for this opportunity. We love you so much and we thank God for this day. This is your birthday, your new birth, your rebirth. You're in the kingdom. And so we celebrate you for having made that decision. Wow. Thank the Lord for that. We thank the Lord. Again, just put that hashtag there, I met Jesus. Wow, we celebrate that. Deeper family, we love you so much. What a treat we had today. <laughs> um, worship was amazing. Um, the word of God was rich. We're so grateful that God is connecting the houses of our city together. We thank the Lord for Action Church. We thank you for the opportunity, for the opportunity of Pastor William to proclaim the word there. God's doing something in this city. And we thank you for how he's, we thank him for how he's knitting our hearts together. Why don't you pray for Action Church this week? Pray that God would continue to bless them deeper, that God would continue to open doors for them. We pray for Je Pastor Justin Daly and the team over there. We want to see them thrive because we want to take this city for God. So do that deeper. I'm asking you to do that. Pray for Action Church this week in your prayers. Well, we will uh, see you next time. We love you so much and God bless you.